All right, so we'll go ahead and get the meeting started. Um, as Mayor Pertin Bivens mentioned, uh, we are uh, having our first meeting without uh, Assistant City Manager Fernando Costa. And I can tell you from my standpoint, I really am missing his leadership already and his ability to kind of help us work through the processes as it relates to this plan. But I will say we had a meeting, a couple of meetings today regarding the plan, and I just continue to be amazed at the amount of feedback we've been getting. Uh, I think some really creative things have come out of the workshops we've had already. And so I'm feeling really excited about, one, what our future and what Haven's going to look like, but two, how we can utilize the TIF money to make some of those things happen. So thank you all for coming out, spending your time with us this evening. I will turn it over to Mindy from Interface, and she will lead us through the rest of the evening. Mindy. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I'm really excited to see a big crowd. Um, my name is Mindy Watts. I work for a city planning firm in, Inter in Philadelphia called Interface Studio, and we have been at work alongside uh, you all and your neighborhood leadership and the city's Department of Economic Development and um, the TIF board and Mayor Pro Tem Bivens' office since February here in Woodhaven. Um, quick show of hands, just so I have a sense, was anybody who's here tonight here on that very hot day at the end of June when we were at the international leadership. Okay, we have a great um, returning crew, wonderful. Um, so uh, Mayor Pro Tem asked me to clarify what we're hoping to achieve tonight, and so I will start with that. Um, we are at an exciting point in the project where we're ready to share some ideas for consideration, ideas about the future and the potential for change in the neighborhood and also ideas about what are the assets that we really want to preserve and conserve. And so I'm going to talk, I will try to keep it brief, um, but we have a bunch of slides and a lot of ideas, and so I'll ask that you hold your, your comments until the end, but we have, um, you're holding those um, folded worksheets, and so you'll be able to follow along in the presentation, and at each section, they're color-coded, there's one that's blue, one that's green. You can make some notes about whether or not you think we're on the right track, you can Write us a, you know, a star if you really like something. Or, um, and the whole back of that, of that worksheet is um, open for your comments. And so if you don't want to lose a thought, feel free to jot it down. And after the presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, but we're hoping that you come with an open mind, and, and we hope that you really hear uh, your sentiments and the sentiments that resonate with you and say, yeah, that sounds like my neighborhood, because we've been listening and, and having a really um, productive conversation now since, since February, as I said. So um, before I, I really jump in, I just wanted to ask uh, the collaborative Fort Worth, um, Susan Medina and Brooke, where's Brooke? There's Brooke um, Goggins. Uh, they are our local boots on the ground and they've been helping us with communications and, and public relations for this project, the neighborhood plan. And we also have an economist on the team. He's not here tonight, but he's been helping us understand the market and um, the potential from an economics standpoint. And we're the planners who draw it all up and, and try to tie it all together for you all. So this plan is intended to be a roadmap for the next 15 years in Woodhaven. And it is intended to guide investment and preservation and growth in your neighborhood. The map there is our, our study area for, for the project, and the area that's outlined in, in gray is uh, what we're calling the Woodhaven neighborhood. It is inclusive of um, your neighborhood, but also informed by the TIF boundaries. So TIF 13 um, is hatched in, in reddish color here on the map, and that uh, is, stands for tax increment financing, and it is a, an overlay that um, was established in 2008 and has been capturing some of the value of um, as uh, taxes um, have been collected each year to say we're going to reserve some of that for investment back into this neighborhood, back into this district. And so um, the neighborhood boundaries are a little bit different than what you might think of as traditionally Woodhaven, and that's because we want to be inclusive of the whole TIF district. And when the TIF was um, established back in 2008, it, has a, it had a particular mission, and so I'm going to talk about that a few times over the course of tonight. Um, those dollars that we're accruing to be reinvested back into your neighborhood are intended to um, help fund public infrastructure, particularly for projects that will help catalyze economic development and economic opportunities in the neighborhood. And so um, the TIF has a 20-year horizon, and we're in the end of 2024. And so there's a few more years of collecting that um, value capture to, to funnel back into Woodhaven. But by the end of 2028, um, there needs to be a project list that says, here's the, the idea for where we're going to spend those dollars. 
And so part of our project is to say, how can we understand the neighborhood's priorities? How can we understand potential for change in the neighborhood, particularly economic development, mixed use economic development potential? And how can we identify projects that will help to um, spur or seed that investment and that type of development? But our task is broader than that. Um, we're, we were hired to do a comprehensive neighborhood plan. And so some of the ideas that I'll talk about tonight are, might be well suited for TIF investments to say, here's a way to um, incentivize some of this type of development. Some of it might take bond dollars. Some of it might take philanthropic dollars. Um, some of it might be good old neighborhood grassroots effort um, so I think really um, you'll see a, a range of ideas tonight and it'll be part of our work to say where are the various places and sources of funds that can help to bring some of this to fruition if you all say we like these ideas. The other part of planning um, that is true of any plan is that we're not the first plan and there's often several plans that are happening at once and so it's our job to coordinate and help to make sure that um, what's happening is aligned and um, speaking the same language, heading in the same direction um, so that it's not confusing and the pieces fit together. And so um, on the city side, there's the East Fort East Side Transportation Plan. And so we've been coordinating with Transportation and Public Works on what they're cooking up. And um, the city is embarking on its new comprehensive plan. And so that's called uh, Imagine, Reimagine Fort Worth, excuse me. And so we'll wanna make sure that this plan um, kind of supports or helps to um, find ways in which the comprehensive plan for the city touches the ground in your neighborhood. And then I think we're all aware that there's some big projects that are unfolding within Woodhaven at the same time as this neighborhood plan. And so we got started um, just before the golf course sold, I believe. Um, but we've been doing some homework to coordinate and um, understand what the, the vision for the development team that they've been working on and make sure that what we're hearing from you all as your priorities um, are you know, reported back to them and help to uh, inform their plan and make sure that we understand kind of where they are in their process. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. But so part of our job as planners is to help coordinate and, and connect those dots. Our process at Interface is very much based in um, listening to the community. And so that was the purpose of the June event when we had a lot of different stations and invited people to give us their, their priorities and their ideas for change. Um, it's also rooted in data. So we do a lot of mapping and research and um, we shared a lot of that when we were here in June. There's um, less of it in this presentation, but it's all on the TIFF website if you wanna um, check it out. And so we use those inputs, the um, public input that we hear from you all and the data and research and planning expertise that we've amassed from working in communities across the country. And we say, what could work in Woodhaven and what would feel like it, it um, honors the vision and the values and the voices of the neighbors. And so really we blend all of those inputs to start to identify some place specific strategies. And that's what we're here to talk about with you tonight. So if you remember, if you were here on that very hot day um, back in June, uh, we were talking about kind of big picture visioning. And we said, you know, if what do you love about your neighborhood now that you want to preserve? How would you imagine, um, how would you like to see your neighborhood in the future? And we um, collected ideas and priorities. And so we've got some of that summarized over there. If you didn't have a time to look at um, the results from that event, they're, they're up on the wall over there. And they're a little bit interspersed here in the presentation as well. But now we're ready to report back, and I, I really do hope that it sounds um, familiar to you um, because a lot of it came from you. So we started with the vision. Um, the vision is really just an overarching statement that says, um, here are the main themes, the things that really matter to us as a community. And so we asked you for some words, you know, one word to describe your neighborhood today, one word to describe how you'd like to see it tomorrow. And we tallied them all up, and the bigger the word, the more people said it. And so you can see words that are the same on both sides for today and tomorrow. There's potential, community, uh, safe, friendly. Um, and there's some words that um, we stitched into a very long vision statement that I won't read to you, but I will invite you to read it on the wall over there if you haven't, and feel free to mark it up. But all the words in green are the words that came up again and again, and that um, we hope will tell a story both of 
um, what matters in Woodhaven, what we want to preserve and conserve going forward, and also where we see room for change. So here's where the, the color-coded part of your worksheet um, starts to show up. We have organized the recommendations, and they're really just draft ideas for you at this stage. We organize them into four main categories. So there's one about health and well-being, and how do we remain young at heart in Woodhaven. There's one about the environment and remaining surrounded by nature in this neighborhood. There's one about economic opportunity and being at work and being able to prosper and thrive in Woodhaven. And then there's one about housing and staying home and feeling at home in your neighborhood. And sort of underpinning all of those um, categories, each one will have a series of recommendations. There's a sense that there has to be a real commitment to implementation. And so we'll have a set of strategies that we'll be developing as we finish up the plan that really focus on who's going to do what, when, how soon, with what resources. And so um, all of that, though, we think is really building towards this um, community that's connected and um, ready to, to preserve the best of it and transform um, areas where there's room for improvement. So this map um, is a summary diagram zoomed out at the, the scale of the whole neighborhood. And what I'm going to do is just talk briefly about it, and then we'll spend the rest of the presentation sort of zooming into different pockets of the neighborhood and looking more closely at some of the recommendations. But basically, um, we know, you know, that um, there's a discussion around the, the golf course. And I think our job, like I said, is to broaden the, the conversation to say we're looking at the whole neighborhood, and we're looking at, the, in particular, the economic development opportunities in the neighborhood. So what we've identified in those yellow Halo um, areas are places where we see there's what we would say it's susceptible to change. There's potential for redevelopment, not tomorrow necessarily, but um, over the long term. And so we'll look at some of those clusters tonight, and there will be more details that will be developed in the plan. There are some um, connections along streets that say, how can we make the streets um, safer for walking and biking, safer for kids traveling through the neighborhood? There are some uh, green lines that are focused on existing and potential trails. There are some key locations in red stars about gateways. So how do we tell people, hey, you're getting off the highway, like slow down, we're wel welcome to our neighborhood, um, and, and send a different signal as people are entering the neighborhood. And then there's some blue upside down teardrops for some key project locations. And so this map is kind of abstract, but I'm about to make it more concrete for you. All right, so we'll start with the, um, the blue category, um, which is focused on health and well-being. And I think one of the things that we've been struck with is that there is a sense of um, joy among neighbors in your neighborhood. There's a sense of liking to be outdoors, liking to um, have fun together, to play sports together. And so, um, and there's a lot of um, kids here. And so uh, that's where this theme of, of young at heart um, comes from. So there are three big goals here, and then I'll make it more specific with the recommendations um, that we're bringing for your consideration. But the first is we think it's um, a good conversation to start having about the need for a community center in Woodhaven. And that is, can be a big ticket item, and it will take time to marshal the resources and find the right site, but we have some ideas for, com for conversation tonight. And we think it's important to have that indoor gym space and meeting space for not just young people, but people of all ages, um, to have a place to go indoors, outside from the heat. Um, we have some other ideas that are smaller scale about new, safe, accessible places for play in the neighborhood, as well as clean and safe walking and biking paths. And we have, um, there will be some recommendations about programs and um, ways for community members to come together and really enjoy these spaces. So this is just a quick, snapshot of what we heard from you all in June, but you can see we asked thumbs up or thumbs down about the types of public amenities that you would like to have in your neighborhood. And the top scoring ones were sidewalks and trails, a community center, and access to sports. And so that's part of what we're responding to. All of those signs um, that people are holding said, we really need a community center, we really need a place for the kids to go in the neighborhood. And on the survey, we got 145 responses to the survey. And um, the number one requested you know, priority was saying, we really need youth programs, childcare, um, early education in the neighborhood. And when we um, did the research, we said, you know, what's nearby? And really what we found is that there is no indoor place to walk to 
where people can go and play in the neighborhood. And when we were outside at the um, school back in June, there were lots of kids playing and they would take a break, and go home and cool off, and then they would come back. And it was really just very apparent that people are out there, people want to play, and um, there's not a pool and there's not a community center within a five minute drive if you have access to a car, and it's certainly um, not within walking distance. And there's 31% of the neighborhood are kids under the age of 18. And um, what, you know, what we found quite striking is that uh, three, nearly three quarters of households with kids under 18 are headed by a single parent head of household. And so when you think about the need for access to services and access to programs after school or in the summertime, um, all of this sort of underpins that you all know what you need in the neighborhood. And um, that's why we're having this conversation about can we start to talk about um, bringing a uh, community center to Woodhaven? So there's a model that um, we thought might be interesting for you all to imagine in your neighborhood, um, the Chisholm Trail Community Center, which has an environmental um, and ecological bent and, and education. And with all the trees and birds and pride and sense of nature and place that you have here, we thought that that could be an interesting um, uh, model to pursue. And we were, are suggesting that the park that's on Woodhaven Boulevard, that right now just has that one sign, might be a candidate site to be tested to say, look, it's accessible, it's, um, there's a bike lane right there, it's visible, it's not too far from the school. Um, might that be a site where we could situate a, um, a community center knowing that there's other green spaces in the neighborhood? So that's an idea. We also have a, a smaller scale um, idea that's um, a less, less costly ticket item that's saying um, there's a green space outside of the library that's just open. And um, we think that there's some pretty cool projects, uh, models from other places where it's a co-located library and a young children's playground. And you can have trees and benches um, and places for people to sit, for the kids to burn off some energy before they go into the library. And so it seems like it's a piece of public land um, and it might be uh, underutilized right now, and so that seemed like an opportunity worth considering, another idea. Um, on the kind of other corner of the neighborhood, this is looking at the intersection of Randall Mill and uh, Woodhaven Boulevard. Um, we think that there's a few different things going on here that could, could stand to be better. So right now, we know that Quanah Parker Park is kind of close to your neighborhood, but getting there is scary. It's basically like running across a highway and there's no crosswalks and there's no traffic signals and I'm scared to do it as a, an adult and I can't imagine sending my kids across, um, across the street there. And once you get there, the access to the park could be improved. It could be, the trees should be pruned, there should be better lighting. Um, right now it's like um, kind of an ordeal to get back to where the playground is. So we think that this um, corner of the neighborhood could really be transformed as a an entryway to your neighborhood to say, what if we reimagined Randall Mill so it felt more like a neighborhood street and less like a highway? What if we made it easier for people to cross the road and get to that park? Um, and what if we said, we know that there's this coming together of all these trails in Fort Worth here with the, um, the Trinity Trail, and can we um, encourage a trail-based business, like a bicycle-oriented business, to locate there and be a place to be a destination in the neighborhood? And so um, we've sort of studied what's possible and um, what the issues are. And we think there's really some um, mul multiple different ways to do this, but a way to sort of make that intersection feel safer, announce that you're arriving in the neighborhood, create a space where people could come and hang out and have a, a departure point for all of the natural resources in the, in the area. And so a local example of that is the woodshed. Um, I think before we invest in a brick and mortar business, it might be a good idea to do a, a pop-up and say, can we do it every Saturday, have some food trucks, have some music, encourage people to come together and um, ride their bikes and hang out afterwards and sort of build a habit of coming together and um, being outdoors together. All right, so then looking at um, more internal to the neighborhood, Boca Raton, it goes across uh, the neighborhood east to west. It's a wide street. Um, right now, there's not really parking on either side, and much of the sidewalks are exposed. There's a lot of kids walking back and forth to school there. And um, because it's such a wide street, people can move their cars pretty quickly. And so we have some designs that um, 
build upon the the street has been identified as a bicycle corridor in the uh, Fort Worth plan for bicycling. And so it fits and, and we think it's another idea worth considering to say, how do we make this street safer for kids to, to travel along on their way to the library, on their way to school? This is just a, how it looks today, it's pretty wide. Um, and to say we have ample room to add these um, elements to the neighbor, to this uh, key corridor. So that was the blue section of your worksheet and we're gonna move on to the green one. Um, which is focused on the environment, so sort of akin to the health and wellness, but this one's really focused on the trees in your neighborhood, the open spaces, the, the water features, and the presence of the floodplain, and to say, how do we preserve the trees or enhance the canopy? How do we um, have access to the water that's in our neighborhood, the water features, and how do we respect um, the potential for flooding and really be mindful as we think about new development? So not being from here, but having done some work here, mostly in the central part of the city, I was so struck by the tree canopy in Woodhaven. I just had never seen trees like this in, in the rest of Fort Worth. And when I read your city's urban forestry plan, I was like, oh, I'm, that's real, you know, like that's really, you're in your own ecological zone here on the, the east side. And so um, we mapped the tree canopy, which is the map that's shown on the right here. And what I think was notable, but sort of confirmed a hunch that we had is that you can see that much of the neighborhood is really green. And then you can see that the eastern edge and the southern edge are really not green. And the schoolyards, the schools are shown in red, um, or, or some of the institutional buildings, those ones are also not that green. And um, some of the, the shopping areas on the eastern edge there are, are, and the apartment complex areas really lack green. And so last time I was here, it was a couple weeks ago, and I took a thermometer camera thing, and I went to two different locations in the neighborhood, and I um, measured the temperature on the asphalt. And I said, okay, on a shaded street, um, Choya up in the neighborhood under the shade, it was just under 80 degrees on the, on the asphalt. And then in one of the parking lots on Boca Raton, um, it was 100 degrees in the end of September on that asphalt. And I'm pretty sure if I'd done this back in June, my thermometer would have broken because <laughs> it was just so hot. But my point is that um, people talk about this as such a um, shaded neighborhood, and it is in much of the neighborhood. But I think there's real opportunity to fill in some of the gaps and to um, bring more trees to Woodhaven and to not just preserve and maintain your canopy, but really grow it. And so we've identified on the map some locations, but there's sort of three strategies. The city's um, Parks and Rec Department PARD has a plan for neighborhood tree planting that focuses on street trees, and so that's one option. The Texas Trees Foundation has a cool schools program, and that's another option that really looks at how do we add trees to schoolyards. Um, and then we think there's some ideas to say, how do we encourage uh, the green retrofit of some of our parking lots? And there's some models from other cities of programs that have tried to incentivize um, planting more trees or, or more grass to really just break up some of that asphalt that makes us so uncomfortable in, in, in the summertime. We have heard that there is a nature-oriented nonprofit in the neighborhood um, called Econautics, and there's an interest in saying, we have these water features, how do we reconnect and make sure that we are able to enjoy those water features? And there's a vision for making them not just fishable, but swimmable. And I don't know enough about the water quality to, to say anything about swimming, but um, <laughs> I think there are some pretty cool programs that are in this region um, that are um, ways of making uh, water fishable for communities in your neighborhood. And so this, um, pond that's the, the one closer to Randall Mill um, on the golf course is pretty big. It's th almost three acres and um, it's 30% it's bigger than a, a stocked fish pond in um, Hearst, just um, not too far from here. And there's this program called Neighborhood Fishing and they have a tackle loaner box so people, if you don't have your own fishing gear, you can go to the library and, and borrow it. And so um, we thought, you know, this is an interesting model. There's people who are interested in this type of um, program and there's um, opportunity that's really unique to um, the landscape in your city to say, hey, we could, we could maybe do this here. And then the last idea on the, in the environmental section that we have to share tonight focuses on the Encore um, easement line. And um, we know there's been discussion and we know there are precedents for um, building beautiful meadows and trails underneath those, those lines. And this is, um, as I understand it, one of the priority corridors. There's already a pathway um, and parts of it look pretty beautiful and natural, but we think that particularly coming 
um, north from Boca Raton to help connect to the trails um, that are you know, just above Randall Mill um, is an important segment to say that would be a real interesting addition to your trail network in the neighborhood, particularly if we can get those bike lanes on Boca Raton. The next section is the red section on your sheet, and it's about economic opportunity. And so here is where the, the TIF uh, comes back into play, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, the ideas here are saying, are there places, and we think there are, where there's opportunity to say those TIF dollars could um, be used to help spur some denser mixed-use development, particularly along the edges of the neighborhood, where there's good visibility from the highway, where there's proximity to some of the transit um, investments that are happening along I-30. And so we're going to look at some of those um, sites along the edge of the neighborhood. Um, but we're also going to look at some sites within the neighborhood, some of the smaller sites where we think that there might be opportunity for um, a mix of uses and more commercial activity in the neighborhood. And then there's one slide at the en uh, end of the section that focuses on some of the less physical development, but the things that are part of economic development and that we heard about back in June. So about job training and workforce development and about the sort of the infrastructure that um, supports economic opportunity. So just a reminder that um, the TIF, which is only a portion of why we're here, but it is an important part of why we're here, is focused on um, economic development and opportunity in the neighborhood, catalyzing that to say, um, how can we invest in public, um, public infrastructure to um, encourage the types of development that meet the needs of the neighborhood. And so this is again pulling from the June event where um, we asked you what types of new development uses are appealing to you do you think would work here. And so the number one winner was a sit-down restaurant. We've been hearing that since uh, we, our first uh, trip here. Um, we heard, you can see there was a good deal of um, support for a walkable mixed-use hub. And so um, you can see there, it's kind of hard to see, but it's like a, a fountain and some sitting areas and some um, businesses and, and housing all within a walkable format. Uh-oh, there we go. And then the other one that scored really high was a 55 and over active community. And so um, uh, anyway, it, it said to us that you all are open to a, a range of um, options, that you are very responsive to amenity-rich development that has places for the community to be and that really um, uh, serves the neighbors who already live here but are looking for places to come together together. And so the economists on our team said, here's the thing. Right now, the commercial market is not that strong in Woodhaven. And when you look at the, um, the numbers of how the TIF has performed, um, the commercial has been a little bit flat. And when we surveyed the neighborhood, we saw that there were one out of uh, six storefront spaces or commercial spaces in the neighborhood is vacant at the moment. And so um, part of that could be a design issue, that there's opportunity to look at new formats of um, commercial buildings that might be more appealing to people looking to start a business. And part of that is staying to the business. We have the spending power to support you. And it doesn't have to just be Woodhaven residents. It can be residents from adjacent neighborhoods, and it can be residents from other places in the, in the city or region who say there's a destination here that I want to come to and that I want to support. And so I'll talk more about housing at the end of the presentation, but I think what our economist, or I know what he said, is part of the key to success for a mixed-use um, development and for uh, new businesses in the neighborhood is to have more households. And um, so we've been thinking about what types of housing could invite more people to live here. And so we sort of said, well, what's here and what's not here? And so you can see here, there's like a range of different housing types. And the columns in white are what you have. So there's a lot of single family housing. There's a lot of um, sort of single family housing on smaller lots. And you have a lot of apartments. And then all of the columns that are in red are different types of housing product that really don't exist here, but that might offer nice um, options for people as they either um, look to buy their first home or they look to downsize because they're tired of maintaining a big home and a big yard and they're saying, you know what, maybe a smaller lot would be actually quite appealing or fewer stairs would be quite appealing. And so part of the, the thinking that we're doing as we're testing it, development potential for some of these sites is to say what types of housing might work where, might work where as well. And so there's different, different models that are um, 
drawn there and with a lot of details, and we'll post this so you all can read the details, but um, there's a duplex, triplex, or quadplex that are sort of, um, basically they share a wall or they share several walls with, with their neighbors. Um, there's townhouses and stacked flats, which are um, common where I live in Philadelphia, but I have, you know, neighbor on either side. Really great, because I don't have to do any mowing of lawn. Um, and then uh, the modern mixed use is the column on the right, which says, uh, if we wanted to have a mixed-use walkable um, format in our neighborhood that has commercial on the ground floor and people living above, um, there is opportunity for like a new style of development that really is different than the apartments that we know that we've had here that have, were built 50 years ago. And to say, how do we invite um, quality new housing product um, of a different form? And so these are some of the um, types of housing that we've been trying on for fit. So the question is where? Where could these things go? And um, so what we've shown here on the map is in orange are some of the places where there is land that um, is changing or in flux or where we see that it could, it could in the future, that there's development um, that is, like I said, susceptible to change over the long term. And so the two that have the big asterisks on them, um, those are big sites that are being studied right now as part of the East Side Transportation Plan. And so we've been coordinating with the team that's working on that project. And, I won't spend time on that tonight. Um, so we'll talk about the three that are in the middle. Let's see, these three um, is what we'll talk about um, tonight um, with, with drawings that we brought to show you. And so the idea is um, where are there places where we could um, kind of create a new gateway into the neighborhood, add some um, density where it's visible and has uh, visible from the highway and has access to the um, transit resources that are being discussed along bridge and I-30, and then that steps down to the meet the neighborhood density in a way that is respectful of the character of your community. And so this is at Bridge Street um, going up Country Club Lane, and this just shows in red, some of these buildings are like very thriving um, businesses, and we're not suggesting that they, that they go away. Um, and some of them are in developments that are quite outmoded, and we think that at some point they might be ripe for redevelopment. So we're just saying, what could fit and what might it look like? And so we're showing that there's an opportunity to build maybe some new mixed use at the um, southeast corner of Bridge and uh, Country Club Lane, and then some opportunity for additional housing, maybe a townhouse format, um, stepping down to the apartments and condos before you get to, to Boca Raton. And so we did a quick drawing to say, this is what the development pattern is now. And if we were to add some buildings that would support that mixed use type of development and that walkable experience in the neighborhood and that signal, hey, you're entering our neighborhood, slow down, there's something to see, that this is um, you know, how that, those pieces might fit together. So skipping uh, up to the north, um, this is looking at a site that's north of Randall Mill, um, just to the west of Riverbend Estates. And there's a large bit of land there. Um, a good portion of it is in the floodplain, and so we've kept that natural. But you see that we've got um, an opportunity site here. Oops, there it is. And um, so we said we think that it would make sense to sort of mirror Riverbend Estates with another um, set of single-family homes that kind of echo what, what is existing on the other side of um, the waterway there. But that there, this might be another place where we could situate some denser development, um, some of those additional rooftops and households who could help support some of the businesses that we're hoping to seed in the neighborhood. And then the last development site that I want to talk about tonight is looking at a portion of the golf course. And I will caveat this to say that if a portion of the golf course is redeveloped, and if we think about where the mission of the TIF might fit best with the golf course, we think that it's really the, the stretch that's flat and wide where the driving range was between the country club, which is here, oops, and the pond. And just to get you oriented, this is Oakmont Lane. And so it, it has the dead end there and that remains. But we think that there is potential in this part of the, the golf course um, that if it was gonna be redeveloped, it's wide, it's flat, it has beautiful natural amenities. And um, we think that there's an opportunity to say, we could create a really special type of development, 
something that we're calling sort of like a, a main street for Woodhaven or Woodhaven Walk to say if there was a new road that wound through that driving range that had enough room for development on both sides of the street, it could create a um, kind of a unique experience. This is um, like a brick street that doesn't have a curb. Cars can drive down it, but it's mostly meant for people. It's mostly meant for sitting outside and dining outside and strolling. And it would have housing on either side, and it would be flanked by, um, we're proposing that maybe instead of the parking lot in front of the clubhouse, maybe the parking lot could go behind it, and, and there could instead be a public plaza or a way to gather in front of the, the clubhouse. And then um, on the, the north edge there, which is on the right side of the screen, a business that is sort of oriented towards the pond and says this is a place to, to eat and to come together with your neighbors and to look out over that pond. And so um, I think really what we're saying is that we know this is a big um, question, what's going to happen with the golf course, and we know that that land is owned by somebody who's actively working on that project. And um, this is our way of saying if a portion of the golf course is not going to be golf, um, here's where we think that there's room to listen to what we've heard from the neighbors, which is that there's a desire for community space, there's a desire for a social gathering place, there's a desire for um, preserving access to, the, to nature and the natural features that are so beautiful here, and um, there's a desire for this kind of walkable, different type of um, commercial destination that is really community scale and, and quite special in the region. And so that's an idea for you all to consider. And then the last slide about um, economic development is about job training, workforce development, um, and how do we kind of connect people who um, want to work with opportunities in the neighborhood. And so we've been, we've met with the East Side Y and have been learning about what types of training programs exist. And we think that there's a real opportunity here to think about um, what are some of the investments that we know are needed in land care in um, stewarding the meadow and trailway underneath the, the um, Encore line, in helping to care for the new trees and, and, and care for the old trees <laughs> that need to be pruned sometimes. And so um, I think that there are some really neat models for training people up in some of those um, arborist and um, land management type jobs. And there's a lot of opportunity in this neighborhood to put people to work in that way. And so we'll try to have um, opportunities that are aligned with some of the, the proposals in the plan. And then the last one I'll just touch on briefly, I think is an idea that requires more conversation with the city, but certainly the TIF is there to um, uh, help fund public infrastructure investments that will support economic opportunity and economic development. Um, but there are some other infrastructure type projects that we think are important for us to be grappling with too, like how do people safely um, sit at the bus stop and not feel like they're um, melting in the sun? Or how do they safely cross, um, cross I-30 if there's going to be a new transit um, or a smart transit line um, on Brentwood Stair Road, if that's where the alternative that gets chosen? And so there will be some recommendations about helping people access transit uh, safely on foot. And there will be, I think, a recommendation for exploration with the city's IT team about um, cell connectivity. So we know that um, as we were doing our ride around with the NPO, we sometimes lost cell service. And um, we've heard that that can be you know, a struggle. It can be a safety issue. And so we think that when we're talking about infrastructure, we should kind of um, bang that drum as well and say there, there could be a need for some investments in um, connectivity here as well. And the last bit of slides, um, and then I'll bring us home, is about um, uh, housing. And so I talked a little bit about the new types of housing that we think could be part of these mixed-use developments. But you all have a lot of housing um, in your neighborhood as well. And um, some of it is like so beautiful and a really important asset worth preserving. Um, so there's like the really iconic single-family housing stock in your neighborhood. Um, some of it is, in, is immaculate and in, in fantastic shape, and some of it is starting to show its age. And so we think that there's, you know, some um, really it's about information sharing about like what are the programs, what are the um, existing resources out there for adaptive modification for someone who wants to um, age in their home, age in place. Um, what was interesting is I think the survey that we did, the community survey, 80% of the respondents 
were homeowners, and the second highest um, ask in the survey, a, a priority that was identified beyond um, programs for youth was um, housing repair assistance. And so this was a need that, you know, I think we didn't necessarily anticipate, but um, apparently is, is there. And so um, there will be some strategies about preserving the beautiful housing stock in the neighborhood. And there will be some strategies about how do we address some of the apartment complexes that are um, really problematic and that are not um, uh, managed well in a way that is providing safe housing um, for neighbors and allowing kind of um, problematic behaviors to persist. And so this is about code enforcement. It's about keeping an eye on um, properties as they may go into foreclosure or approach um, auction and say, maybe there's a, an opportunity for a housing partner for the city to intervene and say, you know what, um, this has been a, a nuisance pro property for a long time and we really need to do something about it and this is our moment. And so um, I think there's like some near-term uh, smaller um, ideas. We heard about gates that are broken or gates that should be removed. We heard about more lighting and about security cameras. And so those are will be woven into the recommendations as well. But I think that um, some of the apartments in your neighborhood are managed beautifully and are lovely places to live. And some of them really aren't serving the people who are, are living there. And so um, that is a piece of the puzzle that we'll need to have recommendations about as well. So what happens next? We are nearing the end of our process. Um, I didn't uh, we were originally trying to have a final plan by December. I suspect it'll be closer to the, the earliest part of the new year. Um, but we are, um, we will take the feedback that we hear from you tonight and we will refine the recommendations and then we will work on implementation. And so um, there will be a matrix that says these are the priorities from the community. These are the um, funding sources available. This, these are the partners who are really important to lead these different parts of the plan. And so. Um, we will be really trying to tie it together in a book that says, here's, the, um, here's what we've heard from the community and what we think is possible. And then um, there will be strategies that are specific to implementation. And so I'll just go through these real quickly. Um, first and foremost, there's been a lot of interest and effort from you all in this planning process. And so we want to make sure that the intentions of the plan get translated to the TIF board as they make decisions about investing the TIF resources. And so we'll be developing a tool or a matrix that isn't just a list of prioritized projects, but that says, here's a way of evaluating projects to say, does this support the goals of the plan and the, the, per, the mission and vision of the community? And so that's one piece. We will be looking to align resources beyond the TIF dollars, because really those are just one component to implementation. Um, there will be some policy change recommendations, and there will be some um, talk about, you know, what are the skills and assets that are existing in the neighborhood among community groups, and who wants to take leadership over or ownership of which pieces of the plan, and where might there be some gaps or capacity that needs to be filled to help carry out the plan. And then um, we will coordinate with the um, city's planning team on the um, Reimagine Fort Worth to make sure that this plan gets kind of uh, is integrated with the city's comprehensive plan and that um, they're working together and uh, you know that helps you all with your projects getting um, aligned up for funding, et cetera, um, to be part of the city's comprehensive plan. So once the plan is done, I hate to say it, but it's really like the hard work is only just beginning. And so it takes time, it takes money, it takes um, advocacy and, and real effort to bring these things uh, to fruition. And so the plan is a tool for you all to help with fundraising, to help with directing the spending of public resources um, and really driving the change that the community wants to see. So to that end, um, we have a, one besides the worksheet, and I will open it up to questions momentarily, um, but we have in the back a, a, a budgeting exercise. And so um, everybody will be invited to take eight stickers and they have different numbers of dollar signs on them. And so we're basically saying of the, the dollar signs, like $1 means it's fairly low budget and fairly easy to implement. And $4 signs means very long-term project, big money, difficult, high, ener high effort um, to, to implement. And so you'll be able to spend two of each of those dollar signs on the projects that you think are um, most important to you. Um, so that is, 
in the back of the two long tables. And um, otherwise, as, you, as I mentioned already, you've got that worksheet. And um, we would be happy to collect any comments. There will be a collection box on the way out if you want to leave us a note. And that's really a good way for us to get specific feedback. Um, but we will take questions. Um, and before I open it up, I just wanted to plug the casino night that I think is happening with, that's being organized by the Woodhaven Neighborhood Association. Um, I think that this is still on and last time, okay. Um, so if you haven't got a ticket, you might consider it. Um, I wanted to note that there is a meeting on the, on the calendar now for um, Crescendo to come back and, and share the latest update and their um, plans development. And so that'll be two weeks away on the 29th at the Potter's House at 6 p.m. on October 29th. And Mayor Pro Tem Bivens left, but we were happy to have her for a moment on her birthday. <laughs> so, um, so that's it. My, e my email's up here, and I'm happy to take questions. And um, I think we only have one. Oh, we have a, we have a microphone. So um, Lindsay will walk around with the microphone, and I will do my best to answer your questions. And if anybody from the city wants to chime in, that's um, welcome, too. But thank you, everybody. Thank you for your presentation. It's just terrific. Uh, my question is that since the apartments are a big part of our neighborhood here, have they been invited to any of these meetings? Have they have any say? What kind of say do they have? And are they monitoring their clientele who lives in their apartments? Because their clientele are the ones who affect the, the character of Woodhaven. Yes. Um, so let's see. We... Um did some very intentional marketing to the um, property managers and put out a lot of yard signs within the developments to make sure that people knew about the neighborhood festival. And we did it again for this for this meeting tonight. We had a decent sign in of um, people who are renters in the neighborhood at the June event. I don't know yet what the data will say about tonight. Um, and we've had a representative from one of the developments who's a property manager as part of the advisory committee that we've been checking in with um, over the course of the, of the project. And I think. Um, we did a ride through um, with um, the MPO at the beginning of the project just to understand sort of the lay of the land and what some of the, um, what's going on in some of those developments. So um, I think that uh, we've, we've tried to connect and we have in some ways, but um, I, you know, I would say like the, the balance, that the majority of the input has probably been from the, um, the homeowner community in the neighborhood. I have one second quick question. Uh, if you've traveled down Rosedale Boulevard or, or Rosedale Street okay. lately, yep. right in the hospital district, they did a terrific job in narrowing the roadway, adding parking, adding trees in the parking, designating uh, uh, bicycle lanes and all of that. Okay. I mean, they did a great job in, in monitoring the traffic, keeping the traffic flowing, but yet slowing it down which is what Boca Raton doesn't have. Yes. Well, I, that's a, thank you for that reference. So we'll go check it out and um, take some pictures. And I think um, that is the vision, is to say, how do we say um, we're in a residential neighborhood here? <laughs> so let's um, you know, travel through it in that, in that way. Yeah. Did you say you were going to post these slides? And yes. if so, where? Um, so the city's uh, TIF 13 page has been the repository for all of our presentations. And so um, I should add that. But if you Google TIF 13 Fort Worth, it'll come up. So it'll probably be up tomorrow or Friday or something. So Well, I'm very impressed. First Thank of you. All. Remarkable job. But my question is, would any groundbreaking or work not begin until the TIF matures in 28? Um, not necessarily. So I think the TIF does not have to wait until it's totally done to spend money. Um, what has to happen, Robert, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, is that the, the dollars have to be earmarked for projects by the end of the TIF um, on December 31st. Is that a fair uh, description? Yes, as long as the dollars are allocated by the TIF board to a specific project uh, before 2028, those dollars can continue to be spent beyond that term. Would I so we'll be, say, yeah, go ahead. Would I be correct then that depending on what the crescendo 
and it sounds like they're going to be coming up with their plans within the end of the year, maybe. But until that's known, nothing on your end is final. And well, I think we want to make sure that you know, whatever Crescendo brings forward, uh, if, if there's a TIF element of that that we can support, because we know that's a project that's coming forward now, we want to be able to try to do that. So I, I would say, I guess, from a priority standpoint, we want to just make sure we're aligning what we're talking about with what Crescendo is talking about. Thank you. Anybody else? One of the things that exists on the east side that is available to the community are faith-based organizations, mm -hmm. churches, mm -hmm. uh, other places of worship. Woodhaven, other than the Potter House, is really lacking in those things, and that was not addressed tonight. Yeah. How, how would this city, how would this plan incorporate more faith-based opportunities to bring the community together and to provide opportunities there for them to be established in this neighborhood? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think you're, you're right. Um, often when we do this work, like the neighborhood um, faith-based institutions are where we gather, right? It's like where we come together to do our meetings and to have conversations. It's where people already have a habit of, of spending time and coming together. Um, so, you know, I think that that's not a economic development, um, you know, it's not like part of the TIF, but it doesn't, but it could be part of the, the redevelopment of the neighborhood. And I, and I think that, um, I'm not sure that it has come up yet until tonight, but I think it's a really good question to say, is there a, we have land in this neighborhood that is in flux or that is susceptible to change and um, it wouldn't, it would not preclude, um, you know, that type of use certainly, so. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Talia McAllister, and I'm the CEO for Econautics. So I know that got mentioned tonight. Mm -hmm. um, if you have questions about kind of what we're working toward, please feel free to come up and ask me. Um, you can also reach us uh, through our website, which is just econautics.org. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. She was introducing herself, so, um, okay. Okay, well, it is echoey, yeah. I'll, I can repeat it back going forward. Anybody else? Yep. Um, so you talked a lot about the corridor that is um, Woodhaven, uh, yeah, Country Club and the Woodhaven, and then even some Boca Raton. But what about northeast, like north of Albertsons and that uh -huh. Uh -huh. area? Are there plans for that? Or yeah, so I think um, you're right. We didn't um, include much there. Um, there is certainly some land um, up at the intersection of uh, Randall Mill and. Um, 820 um, that we know is uh, on the market. And so I think that um, we haven't done drawings for it, but we understand, you know, we're, we're happy to do some thinking around that. Um, I think that um, there's, there's um, very large, fast roads <laughs> there as well. And so if that's what you're getting at, I think that absolutely there was, I didn't call it out, but we did have a, um, one of the lines in that diagrammatic map that I shared that said, you know, we need to have safe corridors for, for um, people to walk and bike um, north-south over there as well. Got one in the back. Yes, hello. I'm uh, Troy Williams. I'm the Operations Director of the Eastside YMCA. And I just wanted to let everyone know we're highly anticipating you guys' participation as we open up just to give you an update on where we are with yeah. opening. 
Uh, November 25th is the date for our soft opening, and then we want to have a grand opening for the entire community on January the 4th. So that'll be from 10 to 2. It's going to be a community event. We have vendors, health fairs, demos. Uh, we're really excited about being able to build community with the city as we progress on. But I just wanted to give everyone an update, and you will be getting flyers and information about the grand opening. That's wonderful. Oh, sorry, I thought y'all all knew that. Um, it's going to be 1500 Sandy Lane. So it's right across the street from Sandy Oaks Apartments. We kind of know that's a very visible apartment. We're going to be working to rebuild uh, that apartment so it can be an institute of living, positive living for our community. So um, that's, that's where we'll be located. Anybody else? Um, so I will stick around for more questions. It looks like everybody's going to have to take a box of cupcakes home. So please eat popcorn and cupcakes before you go. And they're not going to keep, and I'm not taking them on the airplane to Philadelphia. So truly, please help yourselves. And um, on your way out, please leave us your comments. And please, prior, my colleague Hongyi is in the back waving his arm. And so um, that's where we're asking for people to do some, some budgeting as well.